everybody, this is Sean Riley with Riley Real Estate and MassHomeSale.com with this week's Q&A Saturday video, our first video of 2016. So today I'm going to talk about what are all the costs associated with rehabbing a house. So uh, one of the things that we do in our business is we do buy, um, fix, and resell houses for a profit. and. Uh, so we are often presented with deals from wholesalers and real estate agents as well as talking to direct sellers about selling their house. <coughs> and um, you know, we think it's in, I think it's important for people to understand what all those costs really are. Uh now, you know, often obviously somebody who's selling their house isn't going to be overly concerned about what um I'm gonna be making for a profit when I uh eventually resell it. But it is, you know, um it is good for for if you are somebody who's a direct seller seeing this to understand what some of the costs are so um, you don't think that I'm just trying to screw you over. You can see like, you know, why I'm offering what I'm offering. You might not like it and you might not want to accept it and that's fine. Um, but just to understand what the costs come from. And in some ways more importantly for all of you wholesalers and real estate agents who are out there and like to present us deals, um, you can kind of understand why some of the the things that you think are really good deals, um, but didn't take all this stuff into account. All of a sudden, like, you know, you think are twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar profit deals and I'm looking at it and they're like a couple thousand dollars break even, maybe even money losers. Um so, you know, if you watch all these T V shows or you um listen to just the pitches from like a guru trying to sell you a course, um, you know, you generally hear stuff Essentially, your you know the profits you're making is you take your acquisition price plus your construction costs, subtract that from what you eventually sell it for, and that's your profit. Um, so that's not even close to what you really are going to deal with. You know, sometimes you see some other things taken into account, but for the most part, you don't. Um, so first off, when you go to buy a house, there's going to be closing costs. Um, even if you don't finance it in any way, there's still going to be closing costs. There's always um, some attorney fees. Um, in Massachusetts and other places, you'll have title company fees. There's going to be recording fees. There's always going to be just mis a little miscellaneous stuff. Um, and most important is if you're financing it, there's always going to be costs associated with getting your loan. Uh, same way, you know, those of you who own your own home, um, if nothing else, like you had all those costs when you bought that, um, they're generally magnified. If you're an investor, especially somebody who's acquiring a property that needs a lot of work that you're going to be fixing up and eventually selling, uh, you generally will be getting much more expensive loans. Not always, but that is typical, especially um, for people who don't have tons and tons of cash lying around or um, have really strong banking relationships where they can get stuff done quickly with a bank because a lot of times we also need to move fast. Um, which anybody who's ever gotten a residential mortgage knows that is not a fast process. It has gotten even slower recently. Um, so that's the second big thing is financing. So there's usually a lot of costs at closing and then eventually you obviously you need to make mortgage payments. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Then there are the real estate taxes. And again, you know, we're doing this for profit. So like, you know, um, if somebody's buying it, it's just like a cost of living in the house eventually, or somebody's getting his rental, you factor that in when you're doing your rental analysis. And so when we're doing something where we're going to um, buy, fix, and resell, like that's just one of our costs. Like, you know, you don't recoup that, so that's it's a cost just like anything else. Uh, same thing with insurance and having... So homeowner's insurance, you know, um, not super-duper expensive. Um, it's much more expensive to have non-owner-occupied uh, non insurance, even more expensive to have vacant house insurance, even more expensive to have so, um, vacant insurance during construction or sometimes called builder's risk or something along those lines, renovation insurance, whatever, much, much more expensive. Um, and then you also have things like utilities, and utilities you can bundle in services such as, you know, snow removal in the winter, landscaping the rest of the year, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, you have to have electricity, you have to have some amount of heat, you have to have the water on, usually, you know, you can, you know maybe not for the entire time, but you need to have some stuff on, especially when you're going to resell it. People don't generally like to walk into a nice new house and not be able to, like, turn on the plumbing. 
um, or have lights on or any, or have being freezing cold because there's no heat. Um, then when you go to sell the property, um, you also have closing costs. Um, again, it's not necessarily taken into account. So you have realtor fees. So even if you're gonna, even if you are a real estate agent or gonna just try to sell it. Um, without putting it on the MLS by a for sale by owner type situation, most buyers are working with an agent, so you usually have to at least pay that half of the commission. Uh, we're going to go over a few examples, and in those examples, I only have a buyer's agent commission, so that's assuming that the um, the investor is selling it without using a different real estate agent. If you do that, then you actually need to double that cost at least. Um, so that's a significant one. Also, in all the properties I've ever sold, I would say 95% of them, um, somebody, <coughs> excuse me, the seller has requested a closing cost or repair um, concession, usually in the 3 to 4% range. Uh, so we basically just factor that in always. Um, and then you just have some other general closing costs. Again, you always have your attorney's fees and some other recording fees and things like that. And then, of course, you know you do actually have your income taxes you have to account for. Usually, when I do my projections, I don't worry about that because you know that stuff can change. Everybody's situation is a little bit different. But in general, unless you don't have, unless you know this is the only project you're doing, and you don't have any other sources of income, you're probably at least in the 25% federal tax bracket. And for Massachusetts, no matter what you're paying, you know five and change, because um, it's considered ordinary income if you sell it. Um, if your intent is to sell it as a rehab and you only hold it, you hold it for less than a year. You know, if you hold, if you try, if you hold it as a rental for some amount of time for more than a year, you, things are a little different. But that's generally not what we're talking about here. So you know, once you actually get your profit number, that's another thirty percent off right there. So there's a lot of stuff to take into consideration here because you know this is our job. So we need to make some amount of money on it. Um, if you going to show a couple of examples. Uh, hopefully they show up in the video. They're definitely going to be in the article on MassHomeSale.com with this. Um, so if you look at this first example here, this is just sort of a typical example of um, what you would see. You know, a $300 resale of a house, $150,000 acquisition. Those are the projections. These are some of the numbers that go with it. So if you look at those numbers, you know, it's not a bad profit, They're like $22,000, six months worth of work, $45,000 initial investment, you know, not not bad, not amazing. Um, and again, you know, think about this, like, you know, six months worth of work, only $22,000, not exactly um, Donald Trump right there. Um, and so one of the issues with that is this can also get messed up very easily. Um, it does, your projections do not have to be off by very much for these numbers to be much, much, much worse. If we take a look at this example, so it's the exact same situation, except it sells for 5% less, um, so 285,000 when you were hoping to sell it for 300. Again, that's not that big of a um, big of a drop. And as will typically happen when you sell it for less than you're projecting, you have to hold it a little bit longer because you try to sell it for the higher price. Um, so this is only holding it one additional so only one additional month of holding cost and selling for five percent less than the projection. So let's look at those numbers. So now that um, I think everybody would agree was not worth putting up a forty five thousand dollar investment and putting seven months of work into this. Um, so now you kind of have an idea of why people might be offering a lot less than what you're expecting because once you take all these costs into account, things can be quite thin and can get messed up pretty quickly. So, you, so you know, people will try to be fairly conservative. You know, they'll try to project on the low end of what they think they can resell it for, a little bit on the high end of how much work it needs, um, and a little bit on the high end on how long they think they're going to hold it and all that kind of stuff. So that way, if you know, a lot of if it if it hits the fan, um, you're still actually you know, making a little money instead of losing some. Um, I've lost money on rehab projects. It's not fun. It's not fun to work for free for, you know, six, eight, ten, twelve months and actually, like, lose money in the end. 
So, uh, you know, uh, to be honest, looking at, at those examples that we showed, even that first one, we really wouldn't do that project because of the, the situation that you saw in that second one. All, something always comes up. You always go over budget somewhere. You always hold it a little bit longer than you thought for some reason. Um, and, you know, something always goes wrong. So you, you need to take that into account. And if you don't do that, you're gonna you're not going to last very long. So, um, like I said, so even that first example, we really wouldn't do that. If we ended up making that much, that's fine. But that's probably more kind of like if we were projecting to sell it at 315 and we ended up selling it at 3 and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so, anyway, that's... Uh, that sort of sums things up. You know, there's different ways to do Everybody has a different situation. Some people will be able to get their financing cheaper. Um, one thing that we try to do is, so, you know, you can minimize your risk basically one of two ways. You can get the property for a lower amount or you can reduce your costs. So by doing some sort of seller financing short term, you know, if you don't take all your money up front, you take it over, like in, you know, six, eight, ten months once uh, the project's finished and it resells. So we eliminate, if you saw in those those examples, most of the lender was getting like sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars. Um, you know, if you reduce or eliminate that cost, that's obviously a lot more money that we have as flexibility to be able to pay more for the property or offer you some other kinds of concessions. Um, to make things easier while reducing our costs and, and our risk as well because, you know, if you're not paying that large interest payment on the mortgage, um, you do have more flexibility um, and less risk when you're, you know, if, you're, if you do increase your holding costs um, or your holding time, like that cost is a lot less because you don't have those payments. So something to keep in mind if you are looking to sell a place, if you can be creative and work on a win-win situation, um, you know, it can work out pretty well for both us and for you. Um, so anyway, that about sums it up. If, uh, if you have any questions or comments, put them down below. And as always, if you um, have topics that you would like to see covered in one of these videos, you can um, post it on our Facebook page or Twitter account or uh, put something in the comments below or send an email to info at masshomesale.com. And uh, enjoy your New Year's. I hope everybody enjoyed the New Year's, and we will see you next week. Thanks a lot. Bye.